Okay, so thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Water Symposium. I'm really delighted today to participate in this. And as Steve said, uh, the title of my talk will be SFC, will SFC be, be a replacement for LC or GC or both? This is the work that we did in the late 80s and early 90s. And um, you know, you'll have my reflections on the decision making uh, process from an industrial perspective um, from that time period. Okay, so let's go into um, a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about the background and the business of chromatography, the industrial perspectives around chromatography and experimental design for understanding. Then I'm gonna talk about supercritical applications that uh, we uh, conducted at that time, the examination of pertinent molecules to the ag industry that I'm in by SFC, um, those same molecules and different ones by supercritical fluid and uh, extraction and those applications. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about coupling SFB and SFC and then the conclusions. So the background of course is the business of chromatography, industrial perspectives, experimental design for understanding supercritical fluids. So now the business of chromatography or in 2020 it was the data that I was able to gather. The market space for the chromatography community was valued at $8.7 billion US annually, quite a bit. And it's growing at about a 5.1% annual growth. So it's expected to reach about 11 billion in 2025. If you back calculate that to the early nineties, the mid eighties, it was you know right around a, a one and a half two and a half billion dollar business. But um, in that time period, um, one of the significant breakthroughs in chromatography was supercritical fluid applications in the analytical lab. This was both for SFC and um, extraction or SFV. There were patent battles over ownership, startups and wars over what was the best addition to a, a chromatographer's toolbox, either PACT or Kapolei SFC. And you know, as time went on, SFE became more popular, but meetings were very interesting at that time. There was a, a lot of excitement about the technology and it was a, a fun time to be working on this work. But when, if you step back and think about industrial perspective, perspectives on the chromatography industry, that's not what we do for a living, either in pharmaceuticals or in the ag products business. The only thing that matters uh, about the analytical uh, community and the chromatography or the sample preparation techniques that we use are these things that I've mentioned here. The outcomes from the perspective of understanding the new technology and determining if there's an advantage. Is there an advantage to our business, not necessarily to the chromatography business? So will the technology have an, an advantage over what we are currently doing? Is this a research tool or can the technique be used in the manufacturing QC lab? Will the technique help get our products to market faster with less cost? Is there a scientific advantage? Is it worth the expense? And just the cost of changing um, the value up front, uh, is, is it worth it? Is the upfront cost for the change that we'd have to make in our systems, is, is that actually worth it? So let's move on now. Let's talk about the supercritical fluid applications that uh, we looked at. And I'm gonna start by talking about our experimental design for understanding supercritical fluids. So our approach for evaluating the supercritical fluid viability in the industrial path followed through paths, both you know, evaluating supercritical fluid chromatography as opposed to GC and LC for the routine analysis of our products. And it said, you know, this included active ingredients, metabolites, precursors, and impurities. And how would our molecules of interest behave? So we wanted to see if there was an advantage to using SFC as opposed to GC and LC. And we had to answer that question to, to try to make a switch. And then the second path was, would SFE offer an advantage over our conventional extraction 
techniques for our regulatory samplers. How does it work? How does SFB work? Would it reduce method development time, method analysis time in our laboratories? And would it provide automation of hands-on la labor-intensive sample preparation procedures that we were using? And finally, could these two technologies be coupled to achieve a fully um, automated uh, sample analysis process? So let's talk about uh, the examination of pertinent molecules by SFC, which we spent a lot of work on. So we studied and, and we uh, published uh, two papers. One was on the effects of mobile phase modifiers on retention characteristics of polar agricultural compounds by PAC column SFC. And uh, then the, there was another paper on the retention characteristics by a functional group analysis using SFC. And that was also PAC column, but that was more of a comparison to HPLC. So in those papers, we assessed the feasibility of using SFC to analyze agricultural products. We examined these products, the intermediates and their precursors that contain special functional groups. We modified CO, we used modified um, CO2 mobile phase and typically we used methanol as the modifier. So a fairly polar mole molecule uh, as the modifier. And we determined what was controlling the retention behavior in the SFC. LC was a very, um, is, is a, a stable technology. It's been around for a long time and what controls retention behavior is well known. That was not the case in SFC in the 80s and the 90s. And so we needed to evaluate that. And then we did that assessment on the retention of the compounds in a systematic way where we varied the functional uh, group similarities, their differences and the regio uh, chemistry specificity of those. And so um, I'm going to present that to you um, today so you can see what we did. I'm going to stop this video just so you can see my screen a little bit better as I speak. So we broke things down into six actual groups of compounds and you can see that the polarity or the polarity index and, uh, of these compounds varied just as our modifier characteristics varied. So we used um, uh, five modifiers here, methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, hexanol, and THF. I give you the dielectric constant, and some of you might not be familiar with the polarity index, but that's a relative measure of the degree of interaction of the solvent with various polar uh, test solutes. And then there was these uh, compounds we divided in groups, and the groups are also based on uh, the characteristics that I said we were going to evaluate, you know, the polarity, the functional group placement, so we could see if there were any uh, steric interactions, and um, actually electron withdrawing and, and um, electron donating groups added to the molecule, so we could see those effects. So, let's see. All right, here we go. So the first um, group of molecules were benzene, naphthalene, and anthracene, very nonpolar compounds. Uh, we studied these to determine if there was a size effect on the retention. And as expected, there was minimal retention. The K prime values for these compounds were low. Uh, the most nonpolar mo uh, modifier, which was just, in this case was IPA, gave the lowest K prime value. Not, not so surprising, but the reten retention mechanism based on what we determined was the affinity of the nonpolar molecules for the nonpolar um, CO2 and not necessarily the polar um, silica phase. So, you know, so we didn't see too much difference in retention across the size of those molecules. And then we looked at um, the effects through benzene, toluene, paranitrotoluene and nitrobenzene on retention. And we examined the addition of the weak electron donating methyl group and a strong electron withdrawing uh, nitro group to the benzene molecule. Increased retention was obtained with the electron withdrawing nitro group. So which suggests a weak interaction of the nitro group with the stationary phase, but we still didn't have a whole lot of retention. If you look all the cases, a primes were, were less than four in this whole diagram. Uh, we didn't see any appreciable change when we added um, the methyl group uh, to the molecule. 
And some neutralization of electronic effects were seen when both the amino and the methyl, I mean, the nitro and the methyl group were added in, in uh, paranitrotoluene. But the most nonpolar molecule, IPA, gave the lowest K prime again. And again, the retention appears to be based on affinity for the solubility in the mobile phase modifier. Okay, here we go. A little trouble switching slides. Okay, so then the next group of compounds we looked at, we were looking at the sulfonamide. It's a weaker electron withdrawing group than the nitro group. And the sulfonamide moiety is relatively basic compared to the nitro group. And so this was expected on silica. Uh, the solute affin affinity of the stationary phase appears to be the major retention interaction as the basic amide amid functional groups adhere to the acidic silica surface. The addition of nitro increased retention and caused some regio selectivity. Lower K prime values were seen for the higher polarity monophthalos. Okay, that's consistent with what we had seen before. But drastic retention changes were seen when we added THF as one of the modifiers as opposed to the alcohols. So the retention seemed to be dependent on the non sterically hindered nitro group and not on the sulfonamide portion of the molecule as we went across these series. Okay, if we look at the next um, diagram here, it's the effects of adding a chlorine group to the benzene sulfonamide parent. Theor theoretically, if the hydrogen bonding on the stationary phase with the nitro group is causing the increase in K values, with respect to the parent, substituting a non-hydrogen bonded group, such as the chlorine, should eliminate this increase in retention. And that's what we observed. The position and size of the chlorine reduced the sulfonamide stationary phase interaction as evidenced by the reduced uh, K prime values. The effect of size and blocking capabilities on the orthochloro was not overridden with sterically larger more nonpolar mobile phase additives. So the drastic retention changes that we were saw with THF as opposed to the alcohols were still seen. Um, it looked like the when hexanol was used as the modifier, the primary interaction was between the sulfonamide functionality and the stationary phase. And for the para substituted molecule, methanol was strong enough to control stationary phase interaction where IPA and, and ethanol were not. Okay, so just a few more of these I want to go to. I'm not going to go into as much detail with these, but they're interesting in terms of um, uh, to the left here in this figure, do that. What you see is um, the strongly bonded fluorine group on the, um, oh, I'm looking at the wrong, oh, right here. The strongly bonded uh, fluorine group is replaced first with the non hundred bonding uh, chloride group. And uh, the chloride group did not show any significant change in, in K prime. Uh, values were less than, than four and a few regioselective effects were observed. So there's really no difference between the retention between these two molecules. But there were drastic changes seen when there was a fluorine uh, present. Strong hydrogen bonding is theorized to um, interact the fluorine with the silanols on the silica surface, and that's what caused that. They were not overcome even when methanol, the strongest uh, polarity modifier was used. And um, we have consistently seen that in all our um, supercritical fluid analysis when fluorine was present, that we had really strong retention and it was very difficult to remove things from the silica phase. Okay, when we look at um, the effects of mobile phase modifiers on capacity uh, factors for group five, which is benzophenone, diphenylamine, and diphenyl sulfone, uh, hydrogen bonding with the bridge, bridge group functionalities did not occur. So indicating low stationary phase interaction. Steric exclusion is probably the most likely um, mechanism that's uh, causing that, that interaction. So uh, the K prime differences due to size and shape of the, the modifier controlling the ability to 
to physically position itself so that their interaction might occur is, is what we think was the, was the cause of changes in, re in um, retention. Okay, so um, in these last two diagrams that I wanna show you, the bridge group is lengthened by one hydrogen bonding amine group. And then the second, when we go from benzophenone to benzanalyde to carbon analyde to dimethylcarbonalide. And the bridge group uh, in the dimethylcarbonalide molecule, the hydrogen bonding sites are blocked by the addition of those nonpolar methyl groups. And we can see we hardly get any retention once those polar groups are blocked. But with one, um, Amine group, the polarity of the more polar alcohol modifiers can override any interaction with the silanols of the stationary group. But if the bridge group was too small, the drastic increase in K prime with he when hexanol modifier was used would not have occurred. So the second amine shows significant um, K prime increases. Stationary, in in stationary phase interactions or the controlling mechanism. So when nonpolar methyl groups block the hydrogen bonding sites on the bridge, um, on the bridge of the molecule, values were drastic, K prime values were drastically reduced. And so that was something that we thought we should um, report. So the effects of mobile phase modifier in the last diagram I'm gonna show you about this work is effects of mobile phase modifiers on the capacity factors for with ethylic dicarboxaldehyde, diphenyl uh, phthalate, and um, dipental phthalate. And what we could see from that is that there's no appreciable retention. Oh, the retention is all less than uh, a K prime of four for these non polar molecules. Little or no hydrogen bonding to the stationary phase was apparent. All mobile phase modifiers eluded with compounds readily. And size or steric exclusion could account for the lack of retention that was found with these molecules. But the mobile phase solvation or modifier solute interaction could also be the predominant mechanism. So I think what I was trying to demonstrate with these diagrams is that there is um, uh, a theory be based behind the molecules from these different groups in SFC. And you can predict what re retention we would be able to have for some of these molecules based on the choice of modifier and what the um, functional groups on the molecule might be. We then looked at an examination. This was a, another paper that we published on examination of pertinent molecules. And I'm not gonna go through all this, but what I, I wanna show you is the, the last K prime value that's shown is the K prime value from an HPLC, a standard HPLC um, method using what was very popular at the time, a Wattman ODS, or which is uh, a C18 column. And a very common at that time also was 25 centimeters by 4.6 millimeters. So all the columns that we used in this study were that, that size, 25 centimeters by 4.6 millimeters. What we have in uh, the center column on all these tables is uh, when we use PAC column column SFC with this, the same C18 column, probably a different column, but it was um, the same type of columns, C18 column from Wattman. And then the first column is actually where we used a, a PAC column SFC with a Vidac silica column. So what would be considered a normal, uh, a normal phase separation. And um, these, we, the conditions here vary. There's 2% methanol in CO2 for the mobile phase for the first column. Um, I think it was about 5% methanol in, in the middle column when we had, oops, let's see if we can go back. Uh, when we had uh, the ODS phase and then HPLC, uh, the conditions were just acetonitrile and water. But what the trends were that we see is that um, there was retention and sometimes really long retention when we were using HPLC. Uh, when we went to with the C18 column, when we went to the C18 column with um, SFC uh, and the C, we had very quick retention. We didn't have much retention at all. Oops, this keeps moving. But the first, um, separation, the, col the, column, uh, the first column in all these uh, tables was 
the uh, separation using the silica column. And that's when we had the most variability associated with the K prime value. Um, we didn't get much retention when we had really um, nonpolar compounds that, that that's what you would expect. But we looked at a variety of things. Some of them were precursors precursors to some of our active ingredients. We had some active ingredients here like monuron and diuron and uh, carbanilide. Um, and then we also had some, some standard things that are looked at by SFC, caffeine, and, um, and, and the like. So these were products, actually active ingredients over here where most of these were precursors. So what you can conclude from this is that most of the compounds that we were interested in analyzing for by SFC, by SFC as compared to HPLC, we could analyze for them. You know, maybe we, we would use a silica column as opposed to a, um, a C18 column, but we could see retention differences because of these differences in the K prime. And and we could get retention and therefore separation of most of these compounds by SFC. So that tells you that, that when we were looking at this, that SFC was definitely a viable technique for us to use. And now I can move along to the conclusions that said, trends were, uh, which allowed predictions of retention characteristics were very apparent. We, should, we felt we could predict what we would expect to be able to do in LC but for SFC. Uh, they were related, the trends were related to functional groups on the compounds of interest, the polarity, and then the regiospecificity of a functional group. And um, the normal phase characteristics of SFCs offer separation and retention of relatively polar molecules, as does reverse phase HPLC. So when you're taking on a new uh, technology such as SFC was back at that time, um, there's a knowledge base for the traditional um, technology that you have to compete with. And so, but we felt that we had done enough investigation that we knew how SFC would treat the molecules that we would tend to analyze. Now, my, my next application that, one, that I wanna to talk to you about is supercritical fluid applications. And uh, we looked at the effect of instrumental parameters and soil matrix on the recovery of organochlorine and organophosphate pesticides from soils using SFE. So at the time I had some graduate students um, with someone who had been my PhD advisor, uh, Bob Grove at Villanova. And we shared these graduate students and this is their work, Tim Ostike and John Snyder. They both worked at uh, Lancaster, what was then Lancaster Laboratories in Lancaster, PA. So we evaluated the effects of CO2 and uh, methanol modified CO2 on SFE, we evaluated pressure and density and keeping uh, uh, the effects of temperature at constant density. And then we looked at soil matrices with different organic content and various pHs. And, and I want to uh, show you those results today. So these are um, the organochlorine and organophosphate uh, pesticides that we looked at. Um, they're, they're on the, uh, uh, they're very, they're older compounds. Uh, they're not always uh, user-friendly, but, we do analyze for them and they are um, unfortunately in the environment in different places. So here's the effect. And on the left side, I'm showing you organic phosphates. And on the right, I'm say, showing you organic chlorine uh, compounds. And you can see, oops, keeps moving. Um, that uh, pure CO2, although we did get recovery and the recovery is on our y-axis and all these graphs, Although we did get uh, recovery from for all the compounds that we looked at here with pure CO2, both with the organophosphates and the organochlorines, it wasn't consistent. It was a little bit erratic. And for some compounds, we actually had um, so, some breakdown. This is actually endronaldehyde that uh, didn't do so well. And then when we added methanol uh, modifier to this system, and I believe it was 3% methanol that was added. You can see that the overall recoveries tracked very nicely. Uh, the density, uh, when the density reached about uh, 0.57 or so, most everything was above an 80% recovery. And if you carried it out to about 0.6 grams per mil, um, 
the most of them were extracted. Again, this was um, endronaldehyde that didn't behave uniformly, but you can see that with the addition of small amounts of methanol to your modifier, then uh, we were able to get complete extraction of quite a few pesticides that we were interested in. Okay, so temperature effects at constant density, both for the organophosphates and the organic chlorines. What you need to look at here is this section of the graph because in, in general, they were extremely consistent. Once you get to higher temperatures, of course, you know, if you're not, um, you can start to break things down. And that is what we found was the result where uh, I think this is dichlorovos that um, actually broke down early. And then this again is endronaldehyde that did not behave as all the rest of the compounds did, it actually broke down. But you can see that um, the temperature effects at constant density, we didn't really have a difference once we were able to extract things, the effect of uh, temp changing the temperature, increasing it from about 40 degrees to about 100 did not change our uh, percent recovery for these molecules. And then we looked at um, the effect of modifier with and without a static extraction step. So I'm going to assume you know a little bit about this, but you know, uh, static extraction is where you hold the um, the extraction solvent, which in this case is CO2 modified again with three percent methanol. We held it for ten minutes in the extractor extraction cartridge. And then we had a dynamic flushing step where um, we, we flush everything out. We were using 10 milliliter vess vessels for this material. And um, this is the summation of all 12 pesticides that we were using versus the volume of the supercritical uh, CO2 modified with methanol that you use. But you can see that they all tracked pretty well and that we were able to get excellent recoveries you know, in the, um, in the, I would say it, around the hundred percent range. I mean, in residue work, which is what this is considered acceptable recoveries are usually 80 to 120%. So we were achieving that. Uh, and there wasn't much difference between adding the uh, static um, step or using the dynamic. So the bottom curve is the dynamic extraction alone and the top the top one, which is not that much difference because they level out, was the static and dynamic extraction combined. So it didn't seem to make a difference. So then I want to talk to you a little bit about the chemical and physical properties of dried soils while we're doing this type of work. Um, soils vary uh, drastically, and uh, we found that uh, percent clay was a, a, a huge influence on uh, whether we could extract the soil. Um, sand, we uh, generally use pure sand as our blank. So we considered that it's not able to retain any of our species of interest if they had any kind of uh, polarity at all. Uh, we certainly were looking at the pH and you'll see some effects that we saw with that, but also the total organic uh, carbon content of um, the, the soils that we looked at definitely had an influence. So you can see we were looking at a wide range and this is very typical for what you would do with residue analysis. The sand is considered your blank. We have topsoil that we would furnace to see if the carbon content really had a effect. We would have river, a river sediment that you know had a, a very large percentage of sand in it. And then we would have you know a clay and clay has some interstitial volumes. It has the ability to swell and collapse. And so um, that influenced the soils as well. So recoveries from different types of soils, you can see here, um, when we just use pure CO2 as what we had seen before, um, they were pretty much ranged all over the place depending on what the analyte was. But when we added moisture, to our soils that we were looking at, then uh, we saw higher recovery values and more consistent recovery values across the board. And I think I mentioned that the clay has the ability to swell and collapse. And so actually in classical extraction technologies where somebody would maybe use liquid, liquid extraction, they sometimes add moisture to the soil and they get it 
um, to swell. And then they were able to get into the interstitial volumes and actually remove um, the compounds of interest because they've been able to swell the soil itself. And we'll go into that a little bit more, something else I'm gonna show you. But this is the influence of pH and, and can't read these values, I'm sure, but this is 1.8, 6.1, and I believe 12.4. So we took a, a neutral pH soil at six, added hydrochloric and added uh, sodium hydroxide to it. And you can see the irregularities of the extraction efficiency were more drastic with uh, when we were at the extreme pH. This again is Eldrin, uh, oh, this is dichlorophos, and we believe it was uh, just an interference that would gave us way above 100% uh, recovery. But you can see the most consistent recoveries that we had were at the new, neutral pH. So when we did extractions, that's where we started at. So if we just give a, a high cut overview of the results, um, uh, let's talk about, so except for the sand matrix, pure CO2 alone was not able to remove polar uh, pesticides. But we added, when we added methanol um, to the CO2, polar and nonpolar were able to be extracted pretty uniformly, which was great. Increases in pressure and density increased the recovery, terrific. But temperature didn't show much effect except with endronaldehyde, where um, there was thermal de degradation of the compound and it broke down. Uh, extraction recoveries were high, averaging about 94% over all the data that I showed you. And, and um, precision was to prove about fivefold with the addition of methanol modifier. So variations of pH of the soil changed extraction recoveries and a neutral pH was universally better. Okay, so I wanna go into a couple uh, side experiments here and uh, talk to you about examining modifier effects. And uh, we wanted to understand how these extractions were working a little bit better. And one of the disadvantages of supercritical fluid extraction is you're working at high pressures, of course, but you're in a container that you can't see what's going on on the inside because it's usually, you know, a, a larger tube than an LC column, you know, maybe, um, can't even think of the dimensions, maybe two or three inches long with maybe an inch diameter or three quarters of an inch diameter diameter. So we designed and constructed some instruments so that we could look at what was going on in the SFE cell. And then we also, because we wanted to make this practical, because, um, you know, there was a lot of setup with doing supercritical fluid extraction, because you would load your sample into this cartridge and put it in the instrument and then run your experiment. So we thought if we could do multiple extractions at, uh, in parallel, that that would be better. And we've trying to influence the direction of some of the uh, instrument manufacturers at the time to see it that way. So I just wanna show you some of these diagrams of what we put together. We had this huge control unit and bath unit. It was actually taller than I am. So it was about six foot tall. And we built this high pressure sapphire view cell. So sapphire uh, is uh, glass, which of course this wasn't cheap, uh, is able to withstand the high pressures of supercritical fluids. And so what we would do is we would put our sample matrix in here we would add the modifier to this uh, cell within the sapphire glass. We had a view, a Lexan view cell that we could look into the bath unit. And then we would bubble our CO2 in and, and bubble it out. But we would be able to see how the matrix behaved and whether it was swelling under our conditions and whether moisture was needed to be added or not. So that was very helpful when we were to trying to design experiments of how things would behave in the supercritical fluid extraction cell and whether or not we had conditions that um, would likely enhance our extraction efficiencies that we were looking at. The other advantage of having this sapphire view cell was you were actually able to see when something was supercritical or not because you could see that the phases of the liquid modifier and the CO2 gas were actually merged. So it was kind of a cool thing to have. It was um, home built um, at the time, but uh, it gave us a lot of insights into how the experiments worked. 
And then I'm not going to go into the details of this multi-vessel extractor. I, I just wanted you to see it. So you could either use six samples um, in parallel. So you could analyze all six samples at one time. And these were the extraction cartridges. We had a bunch of uh, valving setups that were uh, uh, controlled by this instrument. This was a SUPEX instrument. I don't, I don't believe they're sold anymore, but uh, it was retrofitted to be able to fit this. And then the alternative was to do uh, 12 samples by handling a pair in series. So, you know, so this one and, and this one would actually be, be done. So it was, um, it was something that uh, was never patented. It, it really didn't, um, it never went commercial, but it certainly helped us to try to sell the use of SFE in our laboratory because we could do multiple things at multiple extractions at one time, similar to somebody setting up a whole series of um, uh, separatory funnels in a hood and doing you know six or eight extractions at one time. So now I want to move on to um, the last application I want to so show you, which is coupling SFE and SFC. And um, let me see, I think we can do this quickly. So we were looking at simultaneous removal and analysis of representative sulfonylurea compounds. These are other active ingredients. They're precursors and metabolites. We looked at soils. We also looked at plant materials. I'll show you those. And we, used the, we also looked at a soil culture medium. And uh, we have to identify and quantify um, metabolites and active ingredients that are our residues. And that's for the registration of our compounds. And the ex extraction influence was uh, monitored by UV detection as well as the chromatography. We use switching valves and we program them via the instrument contact closures to change back and forth between the extraction mode and the chromatographic mode and, and back again during the process. So we used a uh, Eula Packard, which I don't know who remembers, but this was the precursor company to Agilent. It was a 1082 LC that could be retrofitted for SFC. And back in the 80s and 90s, if you had one of these in your lab, you were, you were very happy that you were able to do it. It could handle up to 6,000 PSI of pressure and flow of to 1 to 10 milliliters. It had an ethylene glycol cooling bath that where it operated diaphragm uh, pumps. It had a heater it, and that those that cooling bath kept the pump heads cool. Let me go back one second. And there was a second, there was a heat exchanger to get the mobile phase up to critical temperature. And there was another heat exchanger to make sure the effluent stream coming out of the UV uh, detector cell maintained temperature. So it stayed super critical. And then um, there, there was a high pressure UV detector cell. And so uh, this is an example of one of the target molecules. And um, what we were hoping for was that SFE would give less method development time than conventional multi-step uh, liquid liquid extraction. And we could monitor it by the SFC online. So here's what it looked like. So the, um, the fluid came in from this direction, went through the extraction vessel, filled up a sample loop, and then kept going back to the detector pressure back pre and the back pressure regulator. And this was the extraction. There was a, a connector loop here that wasn't used during this step or this connection here. And then you switch the contract closure. The, the fluid again came in. It, of course, it was usually CO2 modified with methanol. This time it did not go through um, my curse. It did not go through the extraction loop. It came down here, went through the connector loop, flushed out the uh, sample loop cell, pushed it through the analytical column, and then on out to the de detector and the back pressure regulator where it was collected. So now let me show you some of the results that we uh, were able to uh, obtain with this. Uh, if you look at the top chromatogram, we, this was uh, reagent grade sand. So this was our blank where uh, the sulfonylurea had been added. We extracted it for eight and a half minutes. The times here on the sulfonylurea have been corrected for chromatography and extraction times have, have not been added to that. So you could see the similarity. So here's the sulfonylurea looting. Here's some of the other components, you know, a, a metabolite or a precursor that's there. And then the second extraction uh, step went, went around and you saw that there wasn't 
much organic that we were looking at, we were monitoring at two, 220 nanometers. So we didn't have many more organics coming out in that second extraction step, but we did see some more sulfonylurea coming off the blank. We looked at a soil, this is a, you know, um, pretty low clay soil, pretty low carbon soil, neutral pH soil. And um, we had a, a quicker extraction time, one and a half minutes, we saw sulfonylurea, went back to extraction for about three minutes and we saw some more sulfonylurea and then back to extraction again. And it looks like we had a complete extraction of the sulfonylurea with this um, back and forth extraction chromatography. And then we did some whole wheat kernels um, and you know, they're just little seeds that you can see. And uh, again, what you see is extraction, the sulfonylurea, some more extraction, the sulfonylurea, and then um, those very tiny sulfonylurea in the final step. Whole wheat flour, if you can imagine packing that into a column, uh, just flour that you might bake your Christmas cookies with, but um, it once you put any kind of fluid through that, that gets pretty solid and it's kind of hard to extract. So, um, but we were able to get the sulfonylurea off of that, and uh, but we kept the extraction steps to a low amount. So it did work with the flour. It was really difficult to get the sample out of the extraction vessel once we did that. And then we did a cell culture medium. Let's see if I can move my picture around. These are the components. You know, we had some salts in there, L-cysteine, some wheat germ, UDPG, and then we spiked it with the sulfonylurea metabolite. And so you can see we extracted it. We saw the sulfonylurea, more extraction, a little bit more sulfonylurea, and then complete extraction. So we were able to couple uh, those two technologies, which, you know, was an advantage for us. So let me see if I can move this again. The approach for evaluating supercritical fluid viability in the industrial path, we followed those two paths that I talked about in the beginning. And um, SFC could be used to analyze all the compounds that we could analyze by, by GC and LC, although I didn't show any GC compounds here. Um, would SFE offer an advantage over the conventional extraction techniques for our regulatory samples? Well, we saw reduction in method development time, method analysis time, and automation of hands-on laboratory intensive sample preparation procedures. So that was good. And finally, could these two technologies be coupled to achieve a fully automated sample analysis process? And the answer to that is yes. But then if we go back to um, the original criteria I talked about from, is this gonna be an advantage of what we're gonna do and just justify the cost of a change long-term, uh, the long-term value versus the upfront costs. And so when we look at, will the technology have an advantage over what we are currently doing? Well, from an SFC perspective, it really came out to be equivalent. Um, is this a research tool or can the technique be used in the manufacturing QC lab? There's, there was a lot to do to uh, use SFC and a lot to learn. So uh, most of the QC labs use uh, pre-prepared methods, but we definitely came to the conclusion that SFC was a research tool. Uh, will the technique help get our products to market faster with less cost for SFC? We felt it was equivalent. So the answer was maybe no. And SFE, it was slightly better. Um, and is there a scientific advantage? Is it a worth the expense? And so SFC being equivalent and SF being better, was there a scientific advantage uh, and worth the expense? Uh, probably not. So I can honestly tell you, we don't use SFE or SFC in our laboratories today. To me, it's, it's somewhat of a disadvantage. I think for some of the things we do with chiral technology, we maybe should be going back to it. But the evaluation that we conducted at that time did not prove to, to justify the cost of a change. <laughs>
So with that, I want to uh, thanks again for the invitation to participate in the Wooders Symposium. I do want to make a comment about what a great man Jim Wooders was. His legacy was excellent, but just as a person, I think Jim was um, outstanding to uh, almost everyone he met and was certainly supportive to me in my career. And, and we didn't directly work together, but he always had a kind word for, for what we were doing. So thanks again.